Geeks. This is Linda Wood. I'm interviewing Fred Kenny on September 14th at the Langworthy Public Library and our topic is the Depot Square in Hope Valley and remembrance and stories uh, of the square in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s in Hope Valley. So Fred, we'll start with you and where and when were you born? August the 20th, 1920 up on Woody Hill Road uh, three miles out of Hope Valley. So, Was that a farm? Were you born yeah, on a farm? Yeah, yeah, about 180 acres. And Were your parents, uh, your father a farmer? Yes, he came to Hope Valley to be a farmer around 1914. He came to Hope Valley to be the boss farmer up at what is now Fender Hill Golf Course. And they were probably there maybe six years. But that was before my time because I was the first one in the family born up on the farm up in, well, I call it Rockville, I guess, but it really isn't. It's in between. <laughs> Does it have a name of its own? Is it Woody Hill Road. Woody Hill yeah, Road. Brook Farm. Mm -hmm. Brook Farm, Woody Hill Road, yeah. yeah. Do you have many brothers and sisters? There was nine of us at one time. I had one sister and the rest were brothers. So and now I'm the oldest one left. Uh, there's five still left, but I'm, my brother Lloyd and I are the only two left in town. Uh, the rest of them are all run out and uh, for different... Uh, <laughs> <coughs> the, um, the farm that you lived on, though, was a, a large farm. Did you have animals and Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. We'd have starved to death if we hadn't during the Depression. That, truly, that's how, that's how we ate. Uh, we raised. Uh, we stop for a minute while Fred, the phone rings. The phone's ringing. <laughs> what? The phone is ringing, so we have to oh, stop is for it? a moment. I don't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't hear any high pitched. <laughs> really? Noises, and I don't. Uh, no, the camera does, unfortunately. I have trouble hearing the average, the average girl and the average child. Low voices uh, are better. The lower uh, voices. Oh, yeah, the male voices. Are, are your voice is fine. <coughs> but so I was going to ask you um, why your uh, parents moved to Hope Valley. Where were they moving from? Cranston. It's a long story, I guess, but uh, my father was a farmer up at the uh, state prison. And the warden called him in one day and told him that, you know, this prison is no place for you to be raising a young family. And I've got a good job for you down in Hope Valley as boss farmer. And so that's how he came down here, and uh, because the warden yeah. wanted so him. Fenner Hill Farm was a, a what kind of a farm was it? Oh, it was a big d dairy and beef farm at the time, and they had uh, they were renting land all over, mm. uh, clear up into Arcadia and what they call Lewis City, up beyond Arcadia and up mm. through there. And they they raised corn everywhere that they could get. So it was like and a business. It, well, it was, but it was being run by Duty W. Flint, who was the uh, one who brought all of the Fords into New England at that time. He was the yeah. distributor for the Ford Motor Company at that time. Hmm. Yeah, so, and they ran that farm for quite a long time. Did it supply the ACI? Is that how he knew about it? Did it? Uh, well, I don't know how the warden yeah, right. up there knew. He must have known Duty W. Flint, and Duty yeah. W. Flint was looking for a man to come down here and run the farm. That's how my father came down here. But must have left there somewhere on 1919, because I was the first one born up on the farm where my father and mother bought. And what year were you born? 1920. 1920, so. So they must have been there about six years. So. <clears throat> so what are your earliest memories of Hope Valley? Can you sort of describe your early memories of Hope Valley? Well, I didn't get down to Hope Valley much before my uh, seventh grade. I went to school in Rockville, in a little one-room school in Rockville. So if I got down here once a week, we were very fortunate when my mother came down shopping for groceries. And, and I guess the first things I remember out of Hope Valley is going into Sherman's clothing store and buying buying clothes for us kids. And Where was Sherman's clothing store? Where Gus Woodman's is right now. Oh, it's right on the lower level? Yeah, right where, right where Gus is right now, yeah. Okay. And what else do you remember about Hope Valley? What other stores and buildings that you can recall? In? Well, I remember when they built this, the building where West uh, Bakery is now. 
I remember when they built the drugstore or the liquor store. I saw them build that. And where West is used to be a swampy lot with old wagons and stuff, all trash all over the place. I can remember that. And I don't remember the exact year that that was built, but it was when I was a little boy. I remember Depot Square. See, there was a big fire went through from Voluntown, came right down through the farm where I lived in 1927. And after that, they took movable sawmills and moved them all around up in there and cut all of the timber off. And I can remember Hope Valley Square being so full of railroad ties that you couldn't move around there. Mm -hmm. There was just no room for anything except railroad ties mm -hmm. all where the parking lot is at the fire station now, clear out to the road and clear to the railroad These tracks. railroad ties made from? Made from that lumber that they were oh, cutting okay. up there, oak ties. Yeah. Oak ties, well, they still use them in the railroad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, the Ford Green, drove a truck for Elisha Bitgood and hauled those ties out of the woods up there. And they used to have lunch in our yard. And a man by the name of Abe Remington drove a team of horses and he hauled ties out. But Ford would make two or three truckloads while Abe came out of there with a big uh, wagon full of ties. So this is sort of a traveling sawmill that we Yeah, go? Yeah, from the traveling sawmill. Oh. Yeah, and every time they'd cut a big radius, and when they got through that, they would move it somewhere else. Had great big wagon wheels, they would tip the boiler over on it. It was all done by steam mm -hmm. engine at the time. And uh, so they would haul them out and then put them down here mm -hmm. in Depot Square. And then load them onto the And then load them onto the trains to take mm -hmm. them away to wherever they were going to use them. Mm -hmm. So. And when yeah. they hauled them out, how they hauled them out? What they they haul them out with horse and wagons and trucks, yeah. And, uh, so they were, they were cut square, just like ties. yeah, just like a tie. They were all finished to be used as ties on the railroad. Mm -hmm. See, that was mostly oak up in there, so that was. Mm -hmm. And my oldest brother used to take off what they call the slabs, and as they'd run the thing through the saw, the slab would fall off, and he would take it and run up and stack it somewhere. And then and the, the slabs were the rough bark right. on the outside of these ties. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then we probably l lived off that wood for mm -hmm. several years. <laughs> <laughs> we the, heated with wood. Right. and uh, So they'd be here for a year or so and then move on to another? Oh, it wouldn't be even that long, maybe oh. three or four months. Wow. Uh, but it was <laughs> all within a radius of, say, just a few miles. And uh, they didn't move them a long ways until that was all cut off. Right. Yes, then they moved the mill somewhere else. I don't know where they went with the mill after that. Okay. But a man by the name of George Gerard ran the mills, and he ran the big farm over where George Reynolds is right now. That's where George Gerard lived. Gerard, is it? G-I-R-A-R-D, I, -R -A -R -D, I okay. think, Gerard. Mm -hmm. but, but most of the trees would come from this that particular area? Oh, oh yeah. That oh. whole area all the way from... My father's farm clear up through, yeah. up in where John Scunzio lives now, and all up through there. That was all burned off yeah. at the time. And so they went in and cleaned it up after yeah. the fire? Yeah, and took yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. That's fascinating, yeah. And what other buildings do you recall in Depot Square? <coughs> well, of course, the, tra the train station was there, and the grain elevator was there. And the grain elevator sat right out almost into the street where the fire station sits now. Mm -hmm. And that was either a five or a six-story building. It was the highest building in Hope Valley. Mm -hmm. And I think it was 1943 that that burned down. And that's when the reason for the railroad ceased to be. Mm -hmm. and Tell me about the grain elevator. The grain well, Roy Rollins, uh, and I don't know what year he built that. He came here from Illinois. And... Uh, put that grain elevator in, but it was long before my time that the grain elevator was there. My dad worked for that grain elevator for years. He drove the truck and delivered the grain all over the state. Now Rawlins used to bring the grain in, raw corn and wheat and rye and oats and all that stuff came in by the carload full. And it would be, you know, just a plain train, but they put what they call car doors up in front of the door and then they would blow the, the grain in there and it would come in 
and then when it got here, he pulled the train up beside the grain elevator, took those doors out, and it ran into like a big funnel, which took the grain with an endless chain up to the top, and up at the top they would take the uh, the bin and put it into whichever bin they wanted it in. You know, there'd be one bin of corn and another bin well, of oats. That's what I was going to ask you. So up at the top it would be go into... Bins. Wherever they, yeah, they would distribute it whichever bin they wanted. And then they took that uh, grain and they ground it. And they had a means of grinding it. And they had a great big uh, mixer. And they had formulas. And at one time, uh, it was called Roy Rawlings, Roy Rawlings World Record Feeds because the, they kept track of, like one of the universities ran this thing, and the chickens fed by Roy Rawlings uh, grain laid more eggs in a year than, than any other grain. So they could call it Roy Rawlings World Record Feeds. And my father distributed that grain all over the state of Rhode Island. But anyway, after he'd get these cars empty, they would come in by the car full and they'd work all night to get the cars empty. Then they would fill those cars back up with the grain that had been mixed in bags and they'd ship that car out. I think he had seven days in which he could use that railroad car any way he wanted to without paying for it. And they would ship carloads of this grain to Woonsocket, Oak Lawn, and Newport. And my father would go out with a load of grain in the morning and then when he got that load unloaded, he would go to the railroad car and take the grain out of there and deliver it to the customers, the farms all over the state of Rhode Island. And so it would be distributed from Hope Valley or from the Jun R Wood River Junction? But right from Hope Valley? It, it was right from Hope Valley. The mill was in Hope Valley. There, that's where they mixed all the grain and, and, and made it. the grain and bagged it. And when I was in high school, if they were short a man, they would come out and grab me before I went to Wesley High School to come back in and work that day. <laughs> Can you describe what it was like to work there? It was hard work. <laughs> it was hard was work. It dusty too? And yes, of course yeah. it was. Mm. Yeah. And then uh, every Saturday they swept the mill down and my, ba my father bought all of the sweepings that they called the sweepings and sometimes it'd be a thousand pounds of, uh, mm. of grain, all mixed up, you know, cow grain, horse grain, mm. uh, chicken grain. And we fed that to the young stock up on our farm. And uh, we would raise, my father would pick up calves all over the state. We'd probably have sometimes 15, 20 young stock. And then when they bred them and they, they became what they called fresh, then the farmer that, he, that gave him these calves would buy them back <laughs> as, you know, as, as milk cows. Yeah, quite a business. How long yeah. did this go on for your family? Well, the the place burned down around 1943, as I recall it. That was the beginning of the fire department. Mm. They uh, they decided after that burned down they needed a fire department. So a group of people in town, and I was one of the charter members of the fire department, got together and they built a fire truck, <laughs> mm -hmm. which was pretty good. Pretty good. It was a 1934 Dodge, I remember, <laughs> and then. Uh, after they got that, the town of Richmond already had a 1932 Diamond T fire truck, which they finally gave the Hope Valley Fire Department. And of course, the fire department has developed into what you see today. But that was all built with bingos, mostly. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. right. I remember their bingo yeah, yeah. at the old. Every Wednesday yeah. night, I would I would be there, myself, Tony Zagazuski, and uh, you know, four or five others, and. And I would call bingos all, all night, yeah. and yeah, <laughs> we worked there until. Well, I don't know. I left here in 1961 to go to Kingston after I married Barbara, mm -hmm. and uh, I was building a house down there when Blanche died. So uh, I moved down there. So I was sort of removed from both the fire department and the ambulance corps at that time. So then I had a hiatus of I don't know how many years when we came back here. <laughs> So. You, <coughs> do you remember the fire? Were you around? Did you see the fire? Did I was home from the Navy when that burned down, yes. I was home and we were living, Blanche and I were living up in that uh, house just beyond the antique shop. Oh, yeah. Then it became uh, Nichols and Lang with the insurance there. Yeah. And yeah, we were living there when it burned. Yeah, I remember it very well. Can you tell us about that? 
Well, it was a real bad fire. They brought in the big old Fox truck from Westley, which was pumping four lines of water into it, and it, it burned down completely. And it's, uh, that Did was, you know what caused it? Or? Oh, there was always fires in grain elevators. Grain had a Heat. tendency to spontaneous combustion. I don't think anybody ever really knew the exact mm -hmm. cause of it. But, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a real bad fire. Yeah. Do you remember any other fires in... Oh, Florida? yeah, sure. <laughs> Where Georgia Ura is, I saw that mill burn at least twice, maybe three times, <laughs> of course. What was that mill called? And Mary couldn't Bailey's Mill. Bailey's. 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 And uh, okay. um, that was a three-story three mill at one time, and it was a regular uh, woolen mill, yeah. cotton mill, it was both, I think. And they, they made shoddy there. Now, shoddy was a cloth that was made out of rags. And when the rags were brought in, they were run through what they called the picker house, which was a uh, big round disc with a whole bunch of fingers in it. Mm -hmm. And that's what set them on fire, was when these rags, if it hit a button or, or a zipper or something like that, then it set a spark off, and this stuff was already uh, fluffed right up. Uh, yeah. So that's what set the fires in those mills, and that's why they burned. Do you remember three fires there? Yeah, Bailey? yeah. I was the first one I recall was well, I must have been about in the seventh grade because I was going to school in Hope Valley. Mm -hmm. See, never got to school, never got to Hope Valley more than about once a week. We were kids right back up in the woods. Yeah. That was a big treat to get to Hope Valley. It was coming right into the city, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and to go to Westerly was just, you know, that was like going to New York City now, right. which I try to keep out of anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, that was another uh, purpose of the train, I'm sure, was to link people to the other villages. And well, the train was, was used very, uh, a great deal before my time when these Kids from Hope Valley even ran out of town to school on it, and like Catherine Bay, uh, Catherine uh, Burdick used to take it to Carolina to uh, teach school in Carolina. And uh, like I said, Gladys Green, and she'll tell you about this later, but she used to take the train to East Greenwich, and they, they had to go down to Wood River Junction and then take a New York, New Haven, and Hartford train, and. Woodrow Junction used to be called Richmond Switch years and years ago, before my time. But then it became Woodrow Junction. But they, they did, they had this steam train. As I recall it, there was a man by the name of Larkin, who was the engineer on it. And I think there was a man by the name of Baton, who was a fireman and brakeman. Uh, a man by the name of Ralph Watrous was the station master. And I think later, a lady by the name of Belle Wilson became uh, station master there. When you were growing up, <clears throat> and when you, you did eventually go to Hope Valley School? Yeah, seventh grade. Seventh they took grade? us from Rockville School to Hope Valley. And how many years, in, how many years at Hope Valley School? Uh, through the tenth grade, and then we moved there from Westerly to Westerly. Right. We went to uh, junior and senior year in Westerly. Was the train a uh, passenger train then? Or oh, was yeah. It just freight? Well, no. I can't recall the year, but it ceases to be a passenger train. But they they took the steam engine out when it ceased to be a passenger train, and they brought in, and this was brought in basically for Rollins' mm -hmm. uh, business, they brought in a, a switching engine that Reed Schofield ran that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, remember yeah, Reed. told me about him. Huh? Well, Reed ran that switching engine, yeah. and he was uh, Roy Rollins' nephew, who Rollins brought here from Illinois to, to run the mill and so forth. And he ran that switching engine, and he might be carrying one or two cars a day, or maybe three or four a week, or something like that. What was involved in running the switching station? What did he have to do? The what, the switching engine? Yeah. Well, he'd just go down to Wood River Junction and pick up the cars and pull them back to Hope Valley. I was thinking there was something that turned them around. Or oh no, that they never had a turnstile here. They they would either back the train mm. back and forth, you know, whichever direction it was going. They never, they never switched. Right. There was no roundhouse here, right. 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 but 
It wasn't that far, you know. <laughs> it wasn't, I know, it's amazing. <laughs> and trains run as well backwards as they do frontwards, you so know. So the train would just run backwards. But there used to be two uh, passenger uh, stations on that line. One was in Kanachit. Kanachit Depot. Are you familiar with Depot Road down in... Uh, yep. yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, that was a... That was a station in there. I don't recall it. I never got in there. I never saw okay. it. Uh, but then they... Uh, and Gladys told me they used to stop there, and they used to stop in Woodville for passengers right. and take them to Wood River Junction. Then they had to switch to the main trains right. from New York, New Haven, and Hartford. Yeah. So, to the long lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so. Um, so we were describing Depot Square. I think we've pretty much talked about most of the things around there, but there are probably other stores or buildings that you can recall around the square. Um, the grocery stores, the Well, the, the, the A&P store was where that little garage is down here now. My son, they tore that down after my son was working in the store. My son worked there uh, while he was in high school at the old A&P store. On the other side of Spring Street from the library? Or on this side? Of the no, it's just, it was on this street. side. Okay. There was a, a meat market and an A&P and an store. It was quite small. Mm -hmm. And then there was two apartments upstairs over that. And then they tore that down and built this little cement park garage down here. But, uh, yeah, my son worked there for two or three years until mm -hmm. they built a new A&P up in Wyoming, and then he moved up there with it. But he was, was that competition for Browning Store? Was there some feeling of competition I don't or think so. There? Browning Store was a... a little general store. You could get anything from a harness mm. to uh, turnip seeds or whatever. And uh, Browning store was a typical old general store. Okay. Now where Matson has his building now, mm -hmm. is that an old building? Was that used for, some, what was that used for? That was built for storage and, and Gladys tells me that people used to keep automobiles in there. That was built by her uncle and her uncle and I don't recall this, it was John Barber, and he ran a general store in where Cliff Woodmansey is now. Mm -hmm. And that was built across the street there as storage and so forth for that store. And, and Gladys tells me that some people kept automobiles in there and so forth. Mm -hmm. That was not part of the railroad. Right. And uh, somebody told Michelle that it was, but it wasn't, never was. And I asked Gladys about this the other day about it, and she said no, that was never any part of the railroad. But the railroad buildings were built along the brook down there now. Mm -hmm. And one of the tracks that came through there ran almost to the bridge. But, uh, to the bridge? That's there now. It ran almost up to that brook, okay. you know, where it comes under the bridge. Yep. Then there was another track that ran the one down. One straight by Hackin Livery, that bridge. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. There was another track that came <coughs> down. They switched off up there and came down right up next to the grain elevator, where they ran the cars to be unloaded and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the last I remember, that depot building being used was after they started the fire company. We picked up uh, newspapers all over town to sell to raise money for the fire company, and I can remember the old depot being so full of newspapers there wasn't room for anything else in there. And then they would sell them, and it got pretty messy in there for a while after the kids got into the papers and stuff. <laughs> but then they finally tore it down. You, you were describing Hope Valley before we started the interview. How would you describe Hope Valley when you were... Oh. I'd rather not have it on <laughs> tape, but <laughs> it was called and referred to as Hopeless Valley. and. And why was that? Well, <laughs> it was an old mill town. And like a lot of the other old mill towns, it was full of two tenement houses that rented uh, at that time for about $8 a month. They all had back houses. Uh, none of them had running water. They had wells that you took up, went out for a pail and got water. And it, it, that was a... Oh, no. No, no, I wouldn't say that probably came in in the 20s sometime, I can't tell you. But I know up on the farm, we didn't get electricity until 1938, so 
we were a little backward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but Hope Valley itself sort of regained some kind of importance with the granary, I would imagine. It began to perk up a little, or? I don't know if that brought too much importance to it, but it was a, really? it was one of the industries in mm -hmm. town. And of course, the other, the main industry was that brick mill, Bailey's, Bailey's Mill. Mm -hmm. uh, my oldest brother worked in there as a spinner, and others worked in there as weavers. And when did it uh, stop being a mill? Well, I can't remember the exact year it burned down, finally. It was like a three-story mill there, and it uh, it stopped being a mill when it burned down, and it sat there as a relic for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it, uh, people would like to have had something done about it. Finally, a man by the name of Milton Gilman mm -hmm. bought it and tore down the upper stores, and uh, he started a uh, cement block factory in there. Mm -hmm. and then. Let's see, since then there's been a, uh, oh, there's, uh, there was a lace mill ran in there uh, more recently, and Oralux Chemical was in there for a while. And then Georgia bought it, and Georgia has made the L.L. Bean of Hope Valley with it. And <laughs> <laughs> done pretty well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> She's done very well. Really She's done good. very well. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's made, a, uh, I think, a great addition to Hope Valley to have Georgia in there with that yeah. mill. How did you um, get to school from the farm? Well, I walked to school in Rockville. Yeah, but when it moved, when you came to Hope Then in the seventh grade, we had to walk out to Route 138. And we, all the kids on the school bus, met up at, on Breckenridge's porch. <laughs> <laughs> and the house is still there. Bill Orr lives there now. But, uh, and if we missed the school bus, we walked three miles, which we did occasionally, mm. miss the school bus. And uh, that's how we got to Hope Valley School. Do you remember any special teachers or classes at the school? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Lillian Hill was one of my favorite teachers down there. And uh, she taught English and that type of thing. Let's see, there was a Jim Haley was the principal. And everybody thought he was a real tough old card. And he was. <laughs> he was in a way. But I stayed back in my sophomore year, and I found out that Bill, I mean, Jim Haley was one of the nicest guys that was on my second year there. He was just, a, became a friend. Yeah. I had uh, a mastoidectomy, and I was out of school more than I was in wow. in my yeah. uh, sophomore year. And he called me in at the uh, end of the sophomore year. He said, Fred, I know you'd like to go to Westerly with your class. He said, but I know you can't handle it. Now he said, my advice to you, he said, I'll, I'll make it so you can go. I'll pass you if you really insist on going. But he said, I don't think you can handle it, and I think you'd be very wise to stay right here for another year, which, and he was absolutely right, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about geometry or anything like that at all. Mm -hmm. And by the time I finished my second year, I can still quote all the theorems from geometry for you, <laughs> if you want to hear them. <laughs> when you graduated from high school, uh, was the war on? Is that when you... No, no, no. I graduated in 1939. Mm -hmm. And then I got a job in Worcester as a precision, uh, learning precision grinding mm -hmm. at the Heel Machine Company. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, the war didn't start until... Uh, let's see, 1941, I left Worcester to come down to Bostitch, and I, I, worked, I worked in Bostitch for 43 years. I remember you worked in Bostitch for like... <laughs> and the war uh, started while I was working there. And then, then you joined the Navy, didn't you? I was drafted, yeah. basically. <laughs> uh, I did not have to go. I was deferred for several times, <coughs> and each... <coughs> I tried to get in the Navy, and the Navy wouldn't take me. I had punched ear drums and eyes below standing. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you wanted to go in when you were working on a deferment, you had to go and get a release from your company. Mm -hmm. And finally, my boss, the general manager, came down, Jack Wynn, his name was, and he said, I'm getting sick of writing these <laughs> releases for you. He said, do you want to go or don't you? Mm -hmm. and, I, and he said, your deferment is on my desk now, and if you tell me that you don't want to go, I'll sign your deferment, he said, and then, but I don't want to hear from you again. But if you want to go, say so, and I won't sign the deferment. And so I told him, just forget it. 
So then, never dreamed I'd get drafted into the Navy. About three <laughs> weeks later, I was drafted. <laughs> and that particular time I went through the draft board, they asked, do you want to go in the Army, Navy, Marines, the Air Corps? And I said, you mean I have a choice? <laughs> and uh, they said, oh yeah. So I took the Navy, of course, because I'd been trying to get in there. So. <laughs> Well, let's go back to Hope Valley, but and some of the things that your family did uh, with all those boys, uh, and, and a sister, right? You yeah, sister and yeah, all yeah. Those boys. And she was a spoiled brat, of course. But. <laughs> <I can't> imagine. <laughs> <laughs> now, your mother didn't work outside the house. She just worked on the farm. Uh, yeah, and, and my it. mother used to raise uh, 500 turkeys every year just to pay the taxes. <clears throat> and, and she was much more inclined to work out on the farm than she was in the house. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, we raised uh, hundreds of chickens and, and dressed them off and sold them. And like I told you before, we raised young stock. But we were milking three and four, and we sold some milk. Then you didn't have to be, uh, you could s sell milk. And yeah, so. Right. so before I went to high school, I had to get up and go up and milk three cows. And then be in Hope Valley Square at uh, seven o'clock in the morning to get your school bus. Yeah. So. It was not an easy life, but it didn't hurt me any. But uh, so. Did you have any? What did you do for recreation? Did you play sports? Or worked. Did you just no time. For worked for on the farm. Yeah. yeah, we'd raise uh, three or four acres of garden truck, and it would be mm -hmm. canned and stuff like that. And you had to, and we had to cut all our own wood, and haul it in. And I'd get home from high school, and have to hook up the horse and go up into the woods and bring out a load of wood every day. You know, until we had enough out for the winter time. Yeah. Then my father ran a, a, he had a saw rig, they called him. They pulled him around with horses, and he traveled all over Hope Valley sawing wood for people. And after this fire went through, uh, he sold standing wood in the woods for 50 cents a cord. And then they would want it hauled out, so he'd get another 50 cents a cord to haul it out with the horses. Then he'd get another 50 cents a cord for sawing it for them. So, you know, he got a buck and a half out of that cord of wood. <laughs> now it's selling for over two hundred dollars a cord. And a but, lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's what we did for recreation. To be quite frank with you, uh, uh, I did belong to the Boy Scouts up at Yogo, uh, Boy, Yogo Boy Scout Home Patrol, they called it, and Inky Armstrong was our scoutmaster. And uh, so that was basically what little recreation we had off of the farm. But, uh, you didn't play baseball with uh, no. Joe I was never any. I was never any good at sports anyway. But uh, what sorts of places in town were um, sort of where the people gathered to um, reminisce or tell the stories? Grange the Grange Hall. The Grange was the Grange was a big, uh, quite a prominent organization at the time, yeah. and and the Masons. I, yeah. I didn't. I did become a Mason, but way later, in in life. But the Grange is where my family mm -hmm. gathered uh, all the time with other farmers and people. And it was quite an up-and-coming organization at the time. Mm -hmm. It isn't now. Mm -hmm. I guess they're having trouble to exist even. But, yeah. but Would there be social dinners? Would there be dances? And uh, yeah, there was dances. There was dances all over town. And uh, there was movies in town too, you know, mm -hmm. up over where the antique shop is now. Yeah. The old bank building. Yeah. yeah. That the movies went on there until... In the 40s, after I came back from service, there was still showing movies there. And there used to be plays. There used to be plays, and that's... Uh, they used to have minstrels, the black minstrels, yeah. and they'd have two or three of them a year. And that would be... Did you participate in any of these? Yes, I did. I was in quite a few of the minstrels. Okay. Uh, Blanche did too. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, some of the minstrels, if they were quite successful here in Hope Valley, I can recall one or two of them that I was in went down to Bradford to put them on after mm -hmm. for the people down there. And uh, Howdy Woodmansey was always one of the end men and a funny one. He was, <laughs> Howdy was a, he was a card, yeah. you know. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, as I recall it, there was a fellow by the name of Bill Bitgood in town that was always one of the end men. And there was uh, Elliot Miller. Uh, well, there was all those, but I can't, mm. you know, I can't think of who they all were. But oh, it's an end of man. Well, in your minstrels, you, you, you'd have a chorus in the back, 
and then there would be three end men on each side that were pulling jokes and stuff all the time during these minstrels. And you had to be funny to be an end man And they were usually dressed up as clowns or something of that nature. But, uh, yeah. The chorus it was in blackface? Yeah. yeah. The end men was in blackface. The chorus was not oh, necessarily okay. in blackface. They might have been in some of them, but they, yeah. as I remember it, uh, not too much in blackface. But the end men was always in yeah. blackface. Yeah. So. Do you remember any song? Or? Not really. I, w I was not a singer anyway. <laughs> so you can't hum us a little bit? What's that? Can you hum a little bit? <laughs> Can I hum a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> I was in the Navy choir, actually, yeah. uh, but I was in the choir company in boot camp, but, but they took almost anybody in there. And <laughs> <laughs> well, and tell I, me about the library, because I know you've been involved with the Langworthy Library for ages. Well, I didn't, I didn't become involved with Langworthy Library until we moved back here to Hope Valley sometime after the 80s. What about but, as but a child? Barbara, no, I never ever came into the library as a child. I didn't have time. I never was down here that much. But Barbara was on the library board with you, I yeah. think, when we first came yeah, back. Uh, but, uh, let's see, Blanche used the library a great deal, my first yeah. wife. And all of the kids in town that lived in town mm -hmm. used the library. Because the library was over on Mechanic Street, it wasn't here. Oh. It was in a house. Uh, uh, if you go up Mechanic Street, the first house beyond Woodman Seas was the library. On that side of the street? Yes. That it's that white house that yeah. sets up there. Okay. That was the library. And when was this library built in? I think about 1938 or 1939. Okay. And this section here was built on later. I but I think it was right after... I think I was away in service when they built on the second section. But I, I can't hmm. really recall. Hmm. I know the Palmer Brothers... up just up the street here, built it. Mm -hmm. I know the uh, Skeet Palmer and his brother mm -hmm. built the library. I remember that much Lady about it. Lady Gladys Palmer? Uh, probably distantly. Yeah. Probably distantly. Of course, Gladys was your library historian. Yeah. Gladys Seeger was very much involved in the library. Mm -hmm. Still is, actually, with the income from her estate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but Gladys Palmer, of course, left you all your historic, mm -hmm. most historic documents. She was a tremendous historian. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't a her. lovely, a lovely lady. I remember her very well. <coughs> and the Nicholses were involved in some of the money mm -hmm. that runs this. Of course, there was Nicholson Lang with the machine shop. You know that was burned down just before my time. But basically, that is the money that that started this. I think the Langworthy's, well, no, the Langworthy half of the Nicholson Langworthy machine mm -hmm. shop is the ones that started the library, and I mm -hmm. can't go into the history of that because I'm not that familiar with it. You mentioned working for Frank Nichols. Frank Nichols was a, uh, a relative, probably another generation mm -hmm. down from the Nicholses that used to run the... Mm -hmm. Nichols was a very prominent name in Hope Valley. Margaret Nichols was Frank Nichols' daughter, and I was very friendly with her. Mm -hmm. Now, she was always involved in the library, but she went over to Block Island every summer and became the librarian over there every summer. Really? Margaret did. Yeah. And, uh, hmm. So. So this was built in the 30s or so? Yeah. Which you yeah. said 1938, too, so we should, do you were here for the hurricane, 1938? Do you remember? I don't, I don't know if this was up, I can't say. 1938. The barn up there that my daughter owns now that they're putting new sills under right now, that was blew down in 1938. And then they took it all apart and built it back up again. And, uh, but in 1938, we were all in Wesley High School when that hurricane hit. And the first thing that we can recall is that all the tennis courts from the junior high school went flying through the air and went right clean over the high school. That's when we knew we had a storm. So. They let us out of school. We took the school bus back to, we got to Ashaway and one of those big trees blew down right in front of us. And there was a man by the name of Billy Clark driving the bus and he came up and just hit the tree with his bumper. Then he turned the school bus around and went down through what they called Bethel Mill and brought us out that way. And they finally got us to the top of the hill here in Hope Valley and that's as far as they could go. Because Hope Valley was just in great big trees both ways across the road. I think it was several weeks before they got a car through Hope Valley after that. 
because those trees all had to be cut up, and there was no chainsaws. They hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> those are big so, elm trees, I think. Yeah, they, they were, I believe. Yeah. And But they all had to be cut up with a two-man cross-cut saws. Mm. So, and and the, the church steeple blew off. Anything else that you can recall? Well, yeah, uh, the, the building where Gussie Woodman see is now used to have a big cupola mm -hmm. on the top of it, and that landed up behind the school in Rockville. <laughs> that was right up there behind that school, and uh, mm -hmm. then that blew right through the air up there, what, two miles or so, yeah. Uh, no. What was that cupola for? Uh, what was that cupola for on Woodman C building? It, uh, it was, it was, well, there was quite a few buildings around with cupolas on them. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's still one on top of Avery Funeral Home. Yeah, it is. yeah. and uh, I guess they were just lookouts or something. I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, people might have gone up in there and sat and watched what was going on in the community. I don't know. That was a pretty big one up there. It was uh, uh, longer. That's uh, a picture of it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It was. Uh, I don't know, it was probably 20, 30 feet long. Mm -hmm. But that whole thing landed up there in Rockville, I remember that. But, uh, That's amazing. Then you didn't tell me, did you ever ride the train? Oh, wait, sorry, uh, no. Oh, wait, okay, hold on. Hold on one second, we just have to switch a battery. Okay. Not, not as a train. I rode in the engine with Reet once or twice okay. <laughs> after they brought that switching engine in. Yeah. So, yeah. But that was just a little yeah. lock to ride with him, that saw. Yeah, Reet rode that train back and forth to Wood River Junction every day, I think it was. And uh, so, you know, once or twice I did. Right. Now, Rollins had a, a flat car built oh, up. Oh, I see pictures. And <laughs> he had a, a seat going the length of it. Mm -hmm. I think that he numbered it 891 or something like that. And then he issued passes, because he was Speaker of the House up in the State House. Okay. Then he issued tickets. Uh, for free riding on the train on all cars except 891, <laughs> which was the only one he had. So <laughs> it was a joke, but it was a sense a, of humor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. You you had can you describe the engine because I don't. Uh, Will I describe what the please? engine, the engine of it, and, and you had a name for it. Yeah, it was a little. Well, the, the uh, now Gladys can tell you better. On the steam train, uh, I think they either call that the uh, corn popper or something similar. I, Gladys will tell you when you talk with her this afternoon. But that was a little steam engine. And the, 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 the later one that Reet was driving after they shut down the passenger service and so forth here, they brought in what they call a switching engine. And it was a, I know it was a Plymouth switching engine made out in Ohio, but the, it was a diesel and they just ran that to pull those cars around because it most they ever pulled was probably two at any one time so they didn't need any great big steam train. And how big was it? How big was the steam engine? Well I don't I don't imagine it was a big one but I really don't remember. I can recall seeing that steam train down there and I can recall seeing it run mm -hmm. and so forth but I really can't tell you how big it was because I don't. Was it a, as big as a uh, as a school bus or a pickup oh, truck or oh it had to be bigger than that yes oh. but but uh, you know as far as being an engine compared to what they run on your tracks today i wouldn't say it was probably a very big engine yeah. but uh, but you know that was way back a long time ago <laughs> so we're about done but is there anything that uh, you'd like to tell us about hope valley that we haven't asked you a memory or a story that you no, it was a, it was a metropolis as far as I was concerned, you know, from <laughs> up there in the woods. <laughs> but uh, no, there's not uh, a great deal. I remember when they built that uh, Sherman store where, that they just finished tearing down. Uh, band? Do you remember the band that was in Hope Valley? I knew there was one. Yeah. And I know some of the people that was in it. I know Ned Maines, and, and I hope his daughter shows up here this afternoon. She could tell you a lot more okay. about that band. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but he was in it, and I re can't really remember who all was in that band. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, 
I don't really remember too much about the band. Do you ever remember a circus coming to town? No, I don't. I've seen pictures, and some of the old pictures show elephants. I think things. it was long before my time. <laughs> I think it was long before my time, Linda. Okay, okay. But uh, no, I don't really remember ever being. We used to have carnivals every year. Uh, in fact, we built the fire station. We had a, usually had a carnival for about a week mm -hmm. here. I was chairman of it for one or two years. And, uh, you know, it was all gambling uh, r wheels and stuff like yeah, that yeah. And, and that type thing. And, uh, mm -hmm. But that was what we used to raise money for the fire department. Mm -hmm. uh, the church used to have a, a band concert mm -hmm. every year, uh, ice cream social type mm -hmm. thing up there and they Which usually church, got the Baptist Church, the Baptist church. Mm -hmm. uh, either the uh, Westerly Band or the Wakefield Band would mm -hmm. come in for that mm -hmm. but that was always yeah. quite a big evening but uh, so you lived in Hope Valley until 1960 61 when your first wife died uh, I lived in Hope Valley and I moved to Worcester to work and I was up there for almost two years mm -hmm. Then I came back and uh, went to work at Bostitch. And basically, except for the Navy time itself, well, I shouldn't say that. For 20 years, I lived down in Kingston. Right, After right, I married right. Barbara, we moved Barbara, to right. Kingston because that was all over the Charahoe school system. Uh, around, well, it must have been late 50s, Westerly had told us we couldn't send any more kids to Wesley as tuition kids. And the only place that would take tuition kids was Providence. And when they uh, mm. were talking about building Charahoe School, uh, and I won't name names, but someone in the town uh, got a lawsuit to stop them from building it. And I said, well, I've got kids ready to go to school now, mm. and I'm not going to ship them to Providence on a school bus. So we went down to Kingston around 19... 58 probably and bought a lot down there and I started building it. Well, it was about two-thirds built when Blanche died and, and uh, well, it was all fate and that was through that that I met Barbara after Blanche died and so, you know, it wasn't all bad. And uh, Robert, my oldest son, was the first, in the first graduating class from Charahoe, 1961. And uh, the rest of my kids finished high school down in South Kingston. But we never really left Hope Valley. <laughs> <laughs> we lived down there, but right. we, we stayed in really church, and church and so forth. was right. all still here in Hope right. Valley. Right. But, uh, but you worked at Boston. Did you drive to Boston? Oh, sure. oh, sure. There was no other way to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I ran the carpool most of the time, and people paid me to ride with me. Yeah. There was always six people riding together. Yeah. yeah. And Nancy Hinchcliffe uh, claims she got more education in that car than she got in school, but <laughs> don't don't believe everything she tells you. <laughs> uh, That's great. Is there anything but, else, Carla? Can you think of anything? Um, I don't think so. Um, well, I think we had a telephone ringing when you were describing Browning's store. Hmm. Just give us a, you know, t walk us through the front door of Browning's store. What, what would you... What would we see? You'd see Mert and Wallace sitting on the front step, probably. <laughs> and uh, as Mert I remember, and Wallace Browning? yeah, they were brothers. And uh, as I remember, Mert chewed tobacco. <laughs> 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 but the two of them ran that general store there in Hope Valley, and they carried everything from grain to. Now, was Bud one of their sons? Um, Bud was the son of Wallace, of Wallace, and he continued it after, but not yeah. very successfully. Right. Well, of course, by then your your supermarkets and so forth right. came in, and there was no way they could exist after that happened. Well, well, let's go back again, starting with, can you start with where Browning store was? Well, it's down right now. It, well, it always okay. was right where uh, the lawnmower place is right now, and it was in there, and they carried everything from grain to meats, hand-cut meats, and People, some people swore that the best meats in the state were at Browning's store. Uh, I don't know. We didn't do much trading at Browning's store, as I recall. But there was a meat market where Spring Street Market was had, yeah. too, right? Uh, by Fred well, that was uh, after. I worked there all through high school. 
and that was a man by the name of Ralph Burdick, ran the Universal Food Stores there. Right, Universal. Okay, and I worked there all through high school, and then I went off to Worcester. My brother Lloyd went in there to work mm -hmm. for Ralph Burdick, and there was he sold some meats and so forth. Mm -hmm. But then there was another little meat market over the half of the building where the A and P was. Oh. It was only about ten feet wide in there, but. Uh, you knew Fred Stanley? That Okay, well, his father ran a meat market over there, uh, Arthur Stanley. I remember him in the Spring Street market. Fred, Fred, yes, after they tore that building down, okay. then they, he and Brunel Novak yeah, right. moved over into what is now the Spring Street market. It was just always the Spring Street market, but it was the Universal Food Stores then. But then when they took it over, it, it, they went more into meats and stuff. And uh, Fred and Brunel run that market there after that. So. Uh, you were describing Browning's store as a general. It was just an old general store where people sat around and talked and smoked pipes and stuff like that. And, uh, and sold meats. Uh, just a full general line of canned goods and meats. In fact, there was a, there was a, a truck ran out of there, ran all over town. Uh, Will Nye, really? uh, a man by the name of Will Nye, who was married to the Browning sister, went around taking orders, and there was several of those in town, went around taking orders, they, they deliver an order this week and take an order yeah. for next week. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would deliver everything from mm -hmm. grain to meats to everything. And the other one was up where the antique shop is now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charlie Rathman, let's see before Charlie Rathman ran it. Can't Which remember. antique store now? Which antique store do you mean? What's that? What antique store? The, the Hope Valley Antiques, so uh, the, up the in, the, in the bank building. Okay, yep. In the bank building. Of course, there was a, the general store was in the middle, mm. then the theater was up over the top, and that's where they had the minstrels mm. and the movies. And the, and the bank... Before the bank was there, too. The bank was there then. Okay. And that's where this Stefan Sigazuski that you yeah. were talking about, yeah. yep. he worked in that bank for <laughs> his whole... Somebody yeah, Bob Mudge. Bob uh, Mudge. No, Jack Mudge. Jack Mudge. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, they ran that for years and years and years. Uh, but uh, I don't think they left there until they built the new yeah, bank. I don't, I don't really recall. Like I sort of... Mm -hmm. Oh, Bob Mitchell worked there, too. Mm -hmm. Bob Mitchell was uh, Jack Mudge's uncle. Mm -hmm. But he was the manager. Bob Mitchell was the manager up there. Right. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. Great, thank you.